Bienvenue. Good afternoon and welcome to today's event on adopting a multidisciplinary approach to working in the digital era. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Joel Martin. I'm the Chief Digital Research Officer at the National Research Council of Canada. I'll also be your moderator for today's discussion. Before we begin, I acknowledge that being located in Ottawa, I'm on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Uh, and of course, we all work in different places, uh, different traditional Indigenous territories. And I, I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on this. This afternoon's session uh, is an opportunity to learn how we can strengthen and create strong, future-ready digital solutions in the public service and doing so by adopting a multidisciplinary approach in your work. So why do we need a disciplinary approach or why should we consider it? I'll give you three reasons and then we'll go to turn to the experts. First, because we live in a complicated, increasingly in integrated world, uh, we have to come up with new solutions. Uh, the world that we're connecting is composed of people with diverse backgrounds, diverse needs, and the solutions from one perspective are not going to work. There's a second reason why we need a multidisciplinary approach is that we've tried simple and single perspective approaches. These are the low-hanging low fruit, and it sometimes works. But if we have remaining problems that haven't yielded to these single perspective approaches, we need to have some unique ways of looking at this and looking at it from multiple perspectives, the remaining problems. And a third reason for a multidisciplinary rate approach is that we've seen it work. We have increasing examples of multidisciplinary approaches that do work. Now, I'm not gonna add too much more beyond that. Uh, we have the expert panel with us. And what I'm going to do now is very quickly introduce all four of them and then ask them for their perspective on what a multidisciplinary approach means. So first we have uh, Teresa Dandrea. Uh, she's Director General of the Service and Data Modernization at Transport Canada. She leads uh, several federal government initiatives to create a digital first and da data-driven organization, something we all need. Uh, also, we have Abhishek Gupta. Abhishek has played many roles in AI and ethics, including as a researcher. He's now senior responsible AI leader and expert at the Boston Consulting Group and founder and principal researcher at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. If you're not familiar with that institute, it's an international nonprofit research institute with the mission to democratize AI ethics literacy. We also have uh, Dr. Courtney Doagu, uh, Director and Management Consulting Practice at KPMG. She's also AI and Society Fellow at Center for Law, Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa. With a PhD in law, she's currently working on public policy, regulatory, uh, and responsible technology services, and is developing frameworks for understanding a broader social implications across uh, associated with technology. And then the fourth on our panel is Kate Borowiec. She's Director of Policy and Integration at uh, Treasury Board. Has 20 years of experience with the federal government. She's now the director of the Surge team uh, at the at TBS. Uh, Surge operates like an internal policy consultancy for, for TBS and focuses on high priority, high impact, sensitive, and complex files, the kinds of problems where we need a multidisciplinary approach, I imagine. So what I'd like to do now is uh, hand the microphone over to Teresa to get a sense from her what what it means to have a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, Teresa? Thanks. Thanks so much, Joel. And I have to say, I'm a little like shaken by my panelists. Like that's an amazing, amazing pedigrees. So I'm hoping to learn um, from this as well from, from my colleagues here. So when we're talking about multidisciplinary teams, look, I always look at it, it really is about, you know, pulling different groups of people with different functional expertise together. Um, and I always think of it like a family. Um, so you've got, you know, kids have needs, grandparents bring some sort of experience and wisdom, parents have energy, some of us 
have energy. Um, and then there's a specialization of tasks, right? One cooks, one cleans, one chauffeurs or several chauffeur. And so working together, you, you know, if you, if you had one type of person in this family, it just wouldn't work. What you really need to have is various different people who bring their different perspectives um, and have that diversity across whether it's age or whether it's, you know, um, all sorts of different uh, ideas. Like some people are extremely technical and they just have a very, they bring a technical lens. You have other people who are extremely creative. They bring a creative lens. So for me, it really is about um, pulling in those, those, those different types of people together. So um, I've been, I've been working on multidisciplinary teams for, I'm going to say close to 30 years now. Um, and I've always, I've, I've worked with both and multidisciplinary is always a better solution. So I look at it like from an analog perspective. So we talk digital and sometimes people go, yeah, yeah, that's nice for digital, but that doesn't necessarily work for me. But here's why it does. If you look at it from an analog perspective, let's say you're developing a game, right? So you have people who are creating the rules of the game, right? If you roll the dice, you can go forward, you can go backwards. Um, they're the ones who are, they're the policy makers, right? You have people who are designing the game pieces, right? So are we going to use a die? Are we going to use like a D&D &D type of die? Are we going to, you know, have one of those things that you flip and it, it, it turns around? They're the ones who are designing the game pieces. So they need to watch people and see, you know, what works, what doesn't, what happens when someone has um, an issue with, uh, with vision impairment or they can't see dif the difference between red and green, right? So they have to design the pieces but understand how the users are using it, right? You have the board game design you, and then you have um, people creating scenarios and then you actually have the people who are playing it. And all of these people, right? So are who they're designing, who are creating the rules, who are developing like cutting out, you know, little cards and, and, and the content of the thing and the people who are playing it all have to work together. And that is really what the multidisciplinary team is about, right? It's having all the right people, having them, you know, watching, having the policymakers watch people actually try to try to work through a uh, service and have them and then adjust when you can't go, when you find yourself in a loop that you go forward two spaces, go back two spaces, go forward. You need to make sure that you're working for the people who are actually at the end of the day playing the game, right? So what does that look like for us? So, you know, let's say I always look at it from a, a service perspective because I'm service and data modernization. And so I'm always looking at things from a service perspective. And I always look at it from a PPIT. So the people, the processes, the information and the technology um, that's needed in order to deliver something. So if you think about people, so there are the people who are using it, the people who are administrating your service. So you have service designers, user employee experience designers, you have a whole bunch of people around the table, right? Who you're designing for. You've got the processes, you've got HR, you've got finance, you've got auditors, you talk about journey mapping, you've got various touch points, you've got all the processes that sit in the back end. For information, you're looking at policies, regulations, legislation, like privacy, for example, plus all the data coming in. So any kind of data that you're collecting or data that you're sharing or disseminating um, or that you're using to augment the service, right? So just think of the data, right? You've got DBAs, AI experts, data scientists, business intelligence analysts, the data owners, the consumers, AI developers, MDM, data cow, blah, 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 right? Keeps going. And then on the tech side, you've got designers, you got to design it, you got to create it, you got to configure, you got product procurement teams. And then all the people who are gonna train, right? So the school is a perfect example, right? Working with the school to identify the future needs. So everyone across that PPIT, everything that's involved, those are the people you need to have at the table from the very beginning. And that is what you have as a multidisciplinary team. You've got your auditors, you've got your legal team, you've got your developers, you've got your designers, you've got everyone working together and you've got the people who are training, working together to deliver a solution. Um, and at the end of the day, it just gives you all that perspective. So you don't end up with a wonky one-sided game that you're trying to move and you're constantly getting stuck in a loop or the game doesn't work and people get tired, they get frustrated and they move on. That's great. As, so I started thinking of a video game where the programmers wrote the story and drew the art and then the artists uh, wrote the program. It wouldn't work too well. 
Yep. Or, and I have just to add to, I, I do have, I have a friend who's a, a game developer and they literally sit together. He'll code and they have a, he has a guy sitting right next to him testing and playing the game. And then he'll say, oh, I'm stuck. I can't get the caves too dark. And so then the designer's like, here, let me change that and changes the gradient. Can you see better now? Yes, I can see in the cave, but I can't jump that high. Okay. Developer makes a change. How's that? Yep. Now I can jump. That's how they develop games. And that's how we should be de de developing our services. Thank you very much. Uh, Abhishek. Hey, uh, so that was already a fantastic, I think, example and introduction from Teresa. In fact, uh, I, I, I love the family example a lot more than the example that I was going to bring together, which was uh, the Hollywood model of, of uh, uh, you know, developing a movie which is essentially a you know, multidisciplinary collaboration in the sense that it's an ad hoc assembly uh, of, of people coming from all sorts of backgrounds with, with a variety of skills and experiences to put together, to output a movie, which um, you know, if we imagine, let's say the special effects are not that great, all of those things start to stick out, right? And so bringing all of those people together in an effective manner, I think that's to me what a good multidisciplinary approach is about. So the, the way I like to think about it is that uh, a multidisciplinary approach that is effective, that works really well, is one that can draw out the best ideas in people in an elegant fashion, essentially combining them together to solve some of the toughest challenges that we face today. And this you know, comes as no surprise to everybody listening in, um, and, and the panelists who come with, I think, 100 plus years of experience, if, if we put our, our, ourselves all together, um, the challenges are getting more complex. They are more difficult. They are more interconnected. And that requires us to lean on people who have other specializations that one could not, you know, it, it is impossible for a very small set of people to have all of that embodied within themselves. And so, you know, when I, when I, you know, phrase sort of my idea for what a good multidisciplinary approach is, it might sound very abstract, but I think ultimately what it does is, is that it lends a great degree of purpose to our work uh, and in, in terms of how it brings us together, especially if you think about how it aligns you with the organization's purpose and values. Um, you know, when, when Teresa was mentioning the example of you know, building a solution that meets the needs of its stakeholders, what a multidisciplinary approach allows us to do is to, you know, you can think of it as a Swiss cheese model, right? So you, you're stacking on slices of cheese and hopefully everybody's had lunch. So you're not thinking about food and running away. But uh, when you have a, a, a Swiss cheese model that has many layers, it's more likely that the outcomes and solutions that are finally developed don't have you know, holes that go all the way through in the sense that there would be issues that slip through without anybody's notice because everybody's bringing in that different lens with different, with holes at different places, but when all stacked together, you get something that is solid uh, without uh, without that many holes. Um, just to give you a quick couple of examples where I've seen this work very well is at my former workplace. I used to work as a machine learning engineer at Microsoft. Uh, where our, our mission was to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. Now, the, the core operative there is every person and organization on the planet. And how do you get to that every person perspective? You need to speak to and listen to uh, a diverse perspectives. And that you know, means bringing together people from uh, uh, you know, sociology, human computer interaction, uh, UX design, data scientists, linguists, accessibility experts, for product design, as an example, when uh, things like the Xbox gaming experience are designed, uh, processes like citizen juries that actually bring in these stakeholders deep into the uh, design life cycle and work with them to unearth, to, to discover some of those unarticulated needs. Another place where uh, you know, we operate with that mindset is in my current role. Uh, leading the responsible AI team at BCG, where, uh, you know, just as Teresa was mentioning, we bring together people from all walks of life, especially people from, you know, product design, data scientists, legal uh, uh, privacy backgrounds, and working with them to draw their experiences, their knowledge in a way that helps us achieve our final goal. And, and I have 
you know, and I'll yield in a second. Uh, but it, there is an art also when you're asking them for their help to communicate very clearly what your intentions and goals are so that they can help you in an effective fashion. Because ultimately, what is multidisciplinary approach about it? It's about bringing those people together to develop a solution uh, that solves some of these challenges. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's sort of what what it, it, it means to me. Excellent. Thanks, Avishak. Uh, Courtney. Thank you so much, Joel. And um, so far, I love the family example, love the Hollywood example. It really beats my like restaurant example. So I will, I will park that. But um, just to kind of both of uh, what you've said so far, it really resonates and is aligned with what um, I was going to share. And, and really, it's an opportunity, I think, multidisciplinary approaches to to break down siloed thinking while still recognizing those distinct contributions that we can bring to the table from the distinct disciplines that we that we have or that we uh, have experienced in. Um, and really it's to address the complex challenges that um, we have, uh, we're all dealing with today and really under one vision. So it kind of draws out from what both of you have, um, have so elegantly outlined. Um, and really, um, if we think about issues like in healthcare, technology, infrastructure, or, or other sectors, it's really that, that multifaceted approach. Um, you know, there are legal, ethical, social considerations in many applications, um, as we've all, uh, you know, identified stakeholder considerations from the individuals to the communities, to the environment, you know, to uh, the organization and all of the possible impacts uh, that we can have on those different groups um, or stakeholders. And therefore, it's, it's really important uh, to kind of bring all of the different perspectives to the table together. And just to apply it to the work that I'm doing, and maybe very similar to Abhishek, is um, when we're thinking about responsible technology, um, and Teresa actually also touched on this, is that, you know, with the legal considerations, you know, oftentimes we think about just privacy. The second we think technology, we think privacy. But when we're thinking about things like the metaverse, right, um, and the various applications of technology uh, that are being used, um, you know, there are human rights considerations, accessibility considerations, occupational health and safety considerations, and they all kind of fall under legal, regulatory, maybe as a baseline. But then there are some more technical ones, such as data management. So, um, you know, making sure that you have the right structure and infrastructure to, to actually um, build these applications. And then there are security considerations like cybersecurity and then public safety considerations that, you know, might be present um, and ethical ones, the ones that we um, luckily have been really involved in uh, in the last, I'd say, 10 years hearing about and, and participating in, in those discussions. So um, really it's, it's kind of bringing all of those pieces together to achieve that common outcome or that, that, what, that vision. Thanks very much, Courtney. So, so some of the holes in the Swiss cheese are legal, ethical, uh, social and policy holes. Uh, okay, so now <laughs> we're going to turn to Kate. Sorry that you, you're last on this one one question, but if you want, you can uh, add to, to the question, what's uh, special about the digital world uh, in applying the uh, multidisciplinary approaches? Yeah, no, I'm not sorry at all to be at the end. I, I agree with, um, with what uh, my colleagues have said, and I think it's interesting to see the different versions of what multidisciplinary means, and that kind of demonstrates it, whether it's a restaurant or Hollywood or your family, like those different metaphors are equally applicable ways of understanding the world and then sharing that I think you can see the common thread that falls through all of them even though we come from a different angle um I mean uh I was I was thinking about um I was thinking about the benefits of having a multidisciplinary approach as everyone was talking some of that really being having a common understanding but also the ability to truly value the perspectives other people bring and how they are brought to bear 
um, and having empathy for the experience that other folks are having. And then thinking through what does that mean practically? How do we address that challenge? And then what is the problem that we are trying to solve or able to solve together? Like it, like in a, in a world where there are many difficult things happening on many different levels, um, there's a lot of optimism to be had in that in, and, and relief that no one person has to hold all of the cards or all of the knowledge in one place. Like we all have a way to contribute meaningfully. What I liked about your answer there, Kate, was that there are questions about, it, it's almost like a prerequisite to, ha to, to care about other people's values, uh, to care about, uh, to have empathy about the other people on your team. Are there things that, that need to be, we need to think about ahead of time to make sure that, that a multidisciplinary approach uh, can get started? So how do you even approach the people from the other communities that that might be able to cover the holes in, in your capabilities? Uh, is it all top down? Uh, and, and how do you ensure that a multidisciplinary team can stick together? I can so, jump in. Oh, sorry. No, go oh, ahead, please. So, oh, so uh, go ahead, uh, Teresa, I guess you... And then yeah, I, I was the only the only thing I was going to, to add, and I'll I'll let my colleagues sort of fill in fill in the rest. But um, one of the things I, I did want to mention is that in uh, February 2021, TBS Okro, which is the office of the Chief Human Resource Officer, announced that they are supporting multidisciplinary teams as long as you still respect the policy on people management and related instruments. So I think it's really important for us to highlight that because I know at least within the federal public service, we often get pushback from our HR staff saying, no, 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 you can't have um, different groups. Like you can't have ITs reporting to ECs and you can't have, so they actually have, um, they are allowing for a lot more flexibilities and um, in, in order to allow uh, for that integration of the variety of disciplines and classifications within our uh, traditional structures. So I just wanted to sort of get that out so that people who are, you know, listening to this going, hey, but yeah, that's all nice, but I can't do that. Yes, you can. Um, and just one comment maybe for to, to come back to on that is that when I uh, when Abhishek was giving the movie example, he talked about an ad hoc team coming together with different skills. And so there may be ad hoc opportunities as well as the, the reporting relationship ones. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think maybe Courtney, you were next. Sure, thank you. And just to uh, kind of add on to um, what Teresa was saying is that we, I think one of the things to like maybe one of the first steps is to really understand and articulate what your outcome, like what the outcomes that you're trying to achieve um, and really taking a step back and then pulling together kind of that right team and the right balance of a team. But then in that process, like there's also the process, there's also the tactical component of alignment of goals, objectives, you know, rules of engagement, um, all of the things that will help like facilitating, uh, communicating. I think all of those will be really important, especially when you have um, so many people from, from different disciplines, uh, you know, interpretation and um, expressing and really creating a space for um, people not only to be heard, but to also be understood. And so this also touches on what Kate was mentioning as well. Um, in terms of like the empathy and like um, really being able to um, to listen. Very good. So I uh, go ahead. Well, I think Abhishek, you you had started to speak. Yeah, unless Kate, I think Kate had raised no. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Before. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so so I think one of the things is, as we were talking about how do you bring teams together effectively. I, I was thinking at, at the at the smallest level, at, at the most micro level, it boils down to even interaction between two people, right? Who come from different backgrounds, and and how do you how do you enable and facilitate that? And you know, early on when 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 I started to interact with with people who were not technical, uh, and and who did not speak geek. Uh, how do you go about doing that, right? Or you had, you know, people approaching you asking, you know, questions about the kind of work that you did. And I think starting from there at that micro interaction between two people who come from a different field, 
that's how you know if if we if we start to solve for that then you know we start to scale it up and of course you know the dynamics change and we have to account for all of that but but a few thoughts on on how you enable that one to one interaction across disciplinary boundaries um i think one of the things that i have seen a lot in in doing this multidisciplinary work is there's often a reluctance that comes from this fear of appearing like a noob as we would say in in in, in technical speak or, or in geek speak i would say where you know you're a beginner you don't know enough about the field and one of the ways that i've found to to overcome that is is to just admit that that is true right we we are all noobs uh, uh, at at one point or another but there is just so much knowledge and 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 things out there that we're, that's always going to be true so embrace it and and it starts also by being upfront and acknowledging that you don't have that expertise and that's why you're approaching that other person in the first place right otherwise you why would you go to them um there is also that uh, hesitation that comes from a feeling of otherness uh that's something that i think is is ends up being a psychological barrier where we feel that someone is the other um and i think what what i found is that overcoming that you realize that we're all really colleagues and most people are actually quite willing to help uh but then that requires certain key actions on your end and from experience what i found is that if you're able to state very clearly what is the goal that you're trying to accomplish as you're approaching them to ask questions to ask for their expertise that starts to create a a a good fertile ground for creating that interface formulating your question very clearly um in the sense that it it needs to follow these two i think core ideas which is that the question that you're asking should obviously fall within their area of expertise and that it should be something that's answerable within a reasonable amount of time because sometimes we make unreasonable asks of other people and that's off putting in that interaction and being very clear what research you've already done so that you know you don't waste their time in having them re-explain also explaining who you've spoken to if anybody uh and why not if you haven't done that and why you're reaching out to them and finally i think sharing as much context as possible uh to your ask of that other person when you're interacting with them in a clear language helps and these rules i would say are are fundamental to enabling at least at that micro level collaboration across disciplinary boundaries okay so that that's very interesting a form of communication or breaking down what communication might mean uh or kate just to add on to that i mean there's an opportunity to invite someone in to do a conversation there are very few people i know who if you ask them about what it is they are passionate about and what it is they are working on and the efforts they are making towards solving a particular problem or a field they are invested in that will not share ad nauseum and be thrilled to be able to do that because someone has shown genuine interest like if you show up at the table with a genuine curiosity they will open up um and as someone who is reasonably introverted and has you know over time struggled to figure out how to build a network as a public servant um i have found the that the pandemic has has helped me in a way connect with people online and say i just want to know what you do like can you just tell me about what it is you work on and i just i'm curious about your ideas i'm curious about your approach and then thinking about how that applies to the work that i do and if you know that may serve a purpose in the next 5 minutes it may be a phone call 2 years later um but it has really helped me shape some ideas and some thinking and 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 sometimes with pressure and sometimes not i mean i think i was checked to your point about being the noob um it is a relief not to be the expert um you are always learning new skills you are always learning new ideas um at the same time you may be able to offer something in return and they may be equally interested in your perspective um and building that bridge and that relationship is tremendously valuable in the work that any of us are doing i am the farthest thing from a digital expert um but the team i work on has been sent in to work um in in close partnership with folks who are working on technical issues and the reason is because we come at it with fresh eyes and we can ask questions um that are naive just to say i'm sorry i i don't understand can you explain that to me and then can i repeat it back and is this still true like is this simple not simplistic 
reflects the complexity, but it's also still true. And if that understanding exists, that is tremendously useful and powerful to the group that is trying to drive an idea across the finish line or, or put something forward that is of value um, in, in any number of fields. So anyways, those were both oh, there. That's excellent. So not only is it communication on this particular project, but you could be creating your network by, by reaching out to people on an ongoing basis so that you'll know who to contact under certain circumstances. And I also really liked what, what you just said as a general technique for that everybody can use is uh, just go into, into a, an unfamiliar environment and say, well, I don't quite get it. Could you explain that to me? And can I try to repeat it back to you? And, and let me know if I'm right. A great way to learn, but it's also a great way to make sure that that the other person is doing what Abhishek was saying about clearly defining what it is we're talking about. Very nice. Somebody uh, posted a, a question and it's that, is there a bit of a power shift where there's a recognition that the digital part, well, that's the important part. And uh, all of the rest of the stuff is just helping out the technology. Uh, is, that a, is that a concern or is there a way to deal, mitigate that? You don't have to address that point specifically, but I'd be interested in anybody's reaction uh, in the digital world. Is there anything special about multidisciplinary approaches? I mean, I I have a few reflections and, and that was actually a very interesting comment uh, that we, we, for some reason, and I haven't quite figured this out yet, but for some reason tend to prefer things that come to us in a digital format, uh, uh, disregarding the human labor, as it were, that goes into making everything possible. Just as a quick example, when you think about looking at, uh, you know, digitized books on Google Books, uh, sometimes you have what are called these shadow uh, residues artifacts, where you see someone's thumb on a page. And that to us appears bizarre. Uh, when someone actually was holding down the pages to, mm -hmm. to scan the book, and, and that to us appears bizarre. In fact, that should not appear bizarre. It should always appear bizarre when you don't have the thumbs holding the pages because it's actually someone going in, there's a ton of human labor to go and scan those books. And so why do we, why do we feel that that is strange? Anyways, that is not the question that you asked, but just something to reflect on where we have these you know, varied expectations from the digital world. What I think is a little bit different is in the digital era is that uh, we are experiencing an explosion of complexity, an explosion of the number of interactions that happen between humans and between humans and machines as well. And I think that requires us to rethink how we go about you know, engaging in a multidisciplinary approach. And to me, I think I, I, I would say that there are perhaps three characteristics when we're thinking about this, which is uh, uh, the design of the, the the approach, the efficacy of the approach, and the elegance uh, of the approach as well. And the reason I, I think that those elements are important is because when we're thinking about the solutions that are the outputs of these multidisciplinary approaches, in a digital era, we also have a very high degree of exposure to the kinds of solutions that are possible to a single problem. And so the the there is an elevated expectation from people when we engage in these sorts of uh, approaches, these interactions, which if we don't keep in mind the design efficacy and elegance, you you end up in a place where where the the needs are uh, they're, they're not quite met uh, with with this with these elevated expectations. And so so when we're thinking about this, I think that's that's to me where there is a slight shift. Uh, in, in the digital era when you're thinking about a multidisciplinary approach. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Yep, okay. Courtney? I will gladly jump in. And I was really thinking about the question um, from the perspective of access to this, like individuals in different disciplines. Whereas in, the, in our physical world, you might not have um, as much access just given everyone's uh, busy lives um, and, and schedules and proximity, geography, wherever they are. Um, but I think one of the really interesting things about 
approaching multidisciplinary uh, work research um, is is the ability to have everyone in this virtual room speaking, uh, you know, speaking with one another and sharing ideas in a way that may have not been possible and to a degree that may have not been possible. Um, although I still really love in-person gatherings and, and all of those things, but from a, from a work perspective, I found that access to people and, and to different disciplines has been really maybe a silver lining of, of uh, you know, how we're working today. And then maybe the metaverse will make it better or worse. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. So I can, I can, yeah, I can just jump in very quickly. And, and I think if you look at, so I'm not talking sort of the hybrid analog and digital we've been living in a lot of us for, for a few decades now, but if you go back to like pure analog, like back in the days where you had to stand in line, you had to fill out a form, you had to speak to someone. I think back then, um, you know, as they were developing services or, or, or whatnot, you had much more of a, a connection with the people who were actually using the services, right? Like you were, and as you were developing from a multidisciplinary, it would sort of behoove you to be a little bit more multidisciplinary because you could see, you, you saw all the, like if you think of the medical, you know, environment, you, you know, you're seeing people, you have, the, it's much more of a, a tactile. When you move to digital, you don't necessarily see people, right? So if you if, take that same idea of, you know, going to a counter, filling out a form tell, or telling someone, hi, I've lost my job, um, I need to go on, you know, what are my options? I'm not quite sure what to do. Someone will sit there who has all the policy knowledge and who has all that understanding, talks you through it, help me, so, you know, oftentimes helps you fill things out, goes off, and then they're talking to the policy people saying, hey, we have so many people coming in with this and this and this, is there a way that we can, you know, look at the processes or, or whatnot? Now you don't see it. Right, it's it's a it's we're we're a little bit hidden because of the digital, and I think that's where it becomes really easy. Um, as Abhishek was saying, you know, uh, it becomes easy for the developer um, and the designer to just you know do their own thing, or the developer to just yeah, I can do the interface and I can you know put my own processes in that, and then you end up with something that is not usable, right? Um, because you don't see people struggling, you don't see the pain that it causes somebody who's, you know, um, English or French or, you know, second or third or fourth languages, trying to make sense of legal docking. You don't have someone sitting there helping you and holding your hand. So I think it behooves us in this digital space to be even more um, multidisciplinary, to really look at all of those aspects because we don't have that immediate, um, that immediate feedback that we normally would from a human being standing in front of us crying, saying, I've lost my job and I'm not sure what to do. So <clears throat> the digital tools might connect people or they might separate us uh, by, by wires where, where we don't necessarily yeah. know what's happening uh, elsewhere. Um, Kate. Just to build on that, I was going to say like, keeping in mind the very human experience that goes along with the use of any of these tools like and keeping that at the forefront like what is the story that comes out um and and the different stories that come out because it's certainly not uniform based on someone's comfort their access their uh, uh, Teresa you mentioned language is one version I try to imagine uh my grandparents trying to use any sort of digital tool and it's it's just not going to happen um but they need the support, they need the access to services. Like how, how are we making sure that the people that we are trying to serve are cared for and, and making sure that we are thoughtful about keeping the user at the forefront always, um, digital or otherwise. So just wanna follow up on this idea of tools. This is a, another question that was posted. Uh, and the, the question reads, what are the tools that you all use to help make uh, to build rapport, build trust, sense of belonging. I heard some person-to-person -person tools from Kate mentioned this, this let's make sure we understand each other tool and from Abhishek as well. Uh, and the, the tool of having Zoom or MS Teams as a way of, of bringing your team together more frequently maybe. 
Uh, we heard that there might be a problem with uh, disconnection from the user, but there may be some tools for helping with that. Are there what what are the tools that you would recommend the the audience uh, use in building any part and uh, of the multidisciplinary approach? I can throw in a quick example that that I use all the time, which is well back in the day when we all used to be in person together and, and hang out together with our colleagues, uh, we would walk up to a whiteboard and put up stickies together. And that sense of co-ownership and collaboration that you got in, in, in that shared artifact, which was this blank canvas of the whiteboard and the power and agency that each of you had with your own colored stickies and pens and that you could go and put anything up on the board, doing that through Miro, which which I use a lot, uh, helps replicate that to, yeah, I mean, it's not perfect, right? But but it, it, it gets quite a bit there uh, versus what I used to use before, which was Google Docs for collaboration. And it just never had that same richness and freedom of expression and power and agency uh, and, and freedom of structure even, which that blank canvas offers. So anyways, really quickly, Miro, uh, a great tool uh, that I use all the time. Or being in person again. Well, of course, uh, <laughs> but you know, now we, we we don't have that yet. We don't have yeah, that yeah. yet. So. <laughs> yeah, understood. Uh, maybe I'll go to another question, and this is about um, the the ethics of putting together the the multi uh, multidisciplinary team and the the solutions. Uh, in the technical world, so one part of the question is that in the technical world, there seems to be uh, a bias coming in from the from the digital aspect, uh, and there are different ways to express what that that might be. Um, there is also um, the uh, Abhishek had mentioned that it's very important to talk about the design, the efficacy, and the elegance of what you're putting together, but there's also a concern about the implications, the consequences, the impact on the on the users. Uh, and we have heard some uh, of that already of that that maybe we're too divor divor divorced from the user's experience through the digital tools. Is there anything uh, any other ethical uh, considerations that we should be thinking about uh, in putting together the team, in having a team? I mean, I can jump in with some exercises that we've done bringing together multidisciplinary folks and I'll, I'll yield because I know everybody else probably has a lot of great ideas on this as well. One of the things that we've seen is when you bring together people from various disciplines and backgrounds, ensuring that you have something akin to the notion of psychological safety uh, as, as, a, as a core tenet is, is just non-negotiable. Um, it's 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 often one thing to bring someone to the metaphorical table, but then actually having them participate freely and share their knowledge in a way that's comfortable to them is is a whole other ball game. And and a lot of places stop at just bringing the people to the table, but not really making sure that they are speaking and contributing in a way that's comfortable to them. That brings their ideas forward. And the next step up is ensuring really then that you have people who are listening. And, and I think, uh, you know, Courtney, Kate, and Teresa all made that point of, are, are you really listening to the ideas that are being brought to the table? And are you then incorporating them into, into your approach? So, yeah, okay, Kate. I was just going to say, yeah, around psychological safety, I mean, ensuring that there are some there are some ground rules that everyone at the outset that everyone's voice here is valued and that you each have value to add. And I think there are some very small practical things that can be done in small teams that can then be scaled to whatever degree. But uh, having people acknowledge 
having people acknowledge what their superpower is. Like, what is it that they contribute every time by virtue of who they are and their experiences? Um, because everyone has something to bring to that table. And that is not necessarily reflective of age. That is not necessarily reflective of hierarchy. Um, those things can indicate certain things, whether it's authority for decision-making or, or whatever else that may be. Um, but making that clear at the outset, because one of the things a multidisciplinary team can do is uh, not only break down silos between between different disciplines, but it can also it also levels the playing field in terms of level. Like all of a sudden, there's there's a de leveling that happens in a way. And so um, remembering that just because your position may land at the top of the org chart, there is a skill set that may exist somewhere else in there that is valuable. And making sure that that person feels comfortable having the space to speak. Uh, without fear of judgment, without fear of criticism, and like really in at the outset of a problem, you want all the ideas on the table. You want the great ideas and you want the terrible stuff because that'll give you a range of options in the middle. But if you don't get both ends of the spectrum, you're probably just getting the status quo anyway. So like blow it open a little bit and give people that space. Um, and I would say within that, like, don't dismiss anything, just let something exist. Even if you disagree profoundly, and we all do this as humans, just just let it happen. It's fine. Those are great suggestions. So that what I heard was in in addition to psychological safety, there's a, a, an acknowledgement of the person's value. Everybody's there for a reason. And it's nice for them to know what that is. <laughs> What's their superpower? There's a, a question that that has several parts to it, but I think there's a bit of a theme to it. So you're putting together a multidisciplinary team. Of course, you've got more, the more people, the better. Uh, how, how do you uh, figure out what a manageable size is uh, so that you don't have too many people, but you do have enough people to, to handle whatever your problem is? Uh, there, there are so many different disciplines. Do we need to have 100 people on the team? So that's, that's part one. And then, okay, now you figured out the right size for your team. Uh, what are the uh, accountabilities? How do you make sure that that everybody feels part of the team and that they they feel some responsibility for the outcome? Uh, Teresa. Yeah, I can I can take a stab at this one. Um, so yeah, so I totally agree. Too many cooks in the kitchen is the worst. Um, I love small teams. Um, I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of uh, less is more. Um, I think there's you have to strike a bit of a balance. Um, and I, like I'm not. I I really do think um, having a good facilitator or a good project manager or a good product manager, having someone who can rally people um, is really important. You don't need, even if your team, let's say, is ends up being about, you know, it won't be a hundred people, but let's say you're at, you know, 20 or 30, you don't need all 30 all the time for everything, right? And I think that's something that's really important. I would never, like, I, I know one of the last projects I was working on um, when I was at TBS, we had, you know, our legal team was very heavily involved, but it bored them to tears. They were my friends. I really cared for them. I didn't want them to have to sit there listening to, you know, when we started going deep talking about, you know, various technical issues, the lawyers, they're just, you know, they're like, why are you wasting my time? So I think it's really about knowing when to pull certain people in. When do you put pull in, um, you know, uh, the the legal team? When do you pull in the auditors? Do they need to be at every meeting? Absolutely not. But you kick off. You have everyone. You explain things, and then that's where that facilitator is really important, right? Or that project manager, to be able to just to be able to clearly communicate why are you here? I mean, Kate said some amazing things, um, and I really like that idea of of you know, that clarity of what is your role, what is your superpower, what do you bring to the table, right? So being very clear, why are you here and what do we expect from you, right? And honestly, if Joel, I only expect you to come in for this little piece here and I just want you as an auditor to look at it deeply and tell me, is there a risk here that I am not seeing? You've seen so many of these things and all the audits you've done You've seen so many of these phoenixes, right? 
Um, tell me where are there problems that I can potentially anticipate. And I'm going to need you for three weeks, probably about 50% of your time, sometime in January. Is that okay with you? Can you contribute this thing? Yes, great. So I'm going to copy you on everything. You can pick and choose. You can go deep if you don't have to. Here's all the documentation. But when it's your turn, we'll give you a heads up so that you're aware. And I think having those conversations and having that, that PM really play that pivotal role so that everyone knows. Just back to Abhishek's you know, movie um, example, you know, that's what the production assistants do. They're constantly, whether it's catering, whether it's uh, location scouting, whether it's costume, makeup, actors, you know, special effects, they make sure that everyone knows when they're up, what their lines are, what they're supposed to be delivering, and then they can go, right? And I think that's a, that's a really important piece. So you can have a larger team, but just kind of chunk it up so that you're not, you know, you're not torturing everyone all the time. That's great. And I'm busy in January, so I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> Um, okay, we have another uh, question that's uh, about terminology. There's a lot of terminology that, that we hear. So multidisciplinary is one adjective that we can use for our approach or our solutions or our, our team building. But uh, we also hear interdisciplinary. We might hear cross-functional uh, and one I've never heard before, integrated policy to service. I don't know if that's a if that's a more general term or if it's just a, a more generic. But I think that there are lots of terms around there ar around this idea. And are there important distinctions that we should be aware of, uh, or should we use them interchangeably? Or what what do you recommend, uh, Courtney? I can jump in on this. So. Um... I think it is, so I'll only address interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary um, because they're the ones I'm most familiar with and have worked either in the capacity of research or in project teams and, and frameworks. Um, and I think the way we can think about this is there is like a conceptual component and there is like the more tactical. So um, conceptually, I think it would be important to consider you know, the outcome that you're looking for. So like why you're engaging in either uh, interdisciplinary or multi multidisciplinary approaches. Um, so really like what are the objectives um, that you're trying to set out um, throughout the entire process and, and um, what you expect to achieve at the end. Um, so are you looking to like maybe from an interdisciplinary lens examine uh, an issue through different lenses or use a methodology from a different discipline that would allow you to kind of shed light on, on an issue or a challenge or, um, you know, observe something uh, differently through a different uh, lens. And really, I feel that there is more of an immersion within different disciplines and interdisciplinary. So you could look at, um, and from my experience, like looking at like legal questions or, um, you know, uh, regulatory considerations through social science, um, using social science methodologies, looking at, you know, um, gender through feminist anthropology to explain why, why copyright may or may not protect certain creations, right? So like there's that kind of coming together of different approaches or methodologies and then, um, from a multidisciplinary perspective, and I think we've covered ground here, is, you know, what are the complex multifaceted issues or uh, challenges or problems that you're trying to solve for? And where you're bringing, rather than kind of meshing all of the disciplines together, you're bringing the distinct kind of perspectives because you want to make sure as everyone said, like you're catching everything. <laughs> you're, you're kind of trying to think of it broadly and um, make sure that um, there, are, and, and of course, something may always be missed, but you know, to the extent that you can within the framework that you've created and the objectives you're trying to achieve, that you've caught everything and are at, at least trying to consider them. So um, that's where stakeholders play an important role and 
um, and, and your, uh, all of the team players that you're bringing to the team. Um, that's more from the conceptual perspective. And then I would say tactically, like where you decide to go um, also then has a specific process. So we've covered in great detail um, what we, what are the parameters of like a maybe successful or challenges in a multidisciplinary perspective. And I think that um, it, it matters in terms of planning, discussions, processes, you know, outlining roles, um, and and really taking all of those things into consideration based on on those outcomes. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to repeat back to make sure I understood, and you can tell me if I got it <laughs> get it wrong. <laughs> um, so I heard that one part of it was that interdisciplinary might mean you're going you the the person doing the the solution might go borrow a technique from another discipline, and then that's an interdisciplinary. Uh, application of some technique. It's not necessarily that you're bringing in multiple people with the different perspectives. You might be borrowing a technique. Uh, you, whereas... you can bring, sorry to interrupt, but you can bring different people from different disciplines, but it's really this kind of collaborative um, within disciplines to come through to something that's a little more ingrained. Whereas I feel with multidisciplinarity, you're thinking about um, you know, maybe more concrete lanes in a way, but you're bringing all those lanes together. And that, okay. that's also just my interpretation of kind of the right. experience that I've had with it. So, so I understand. So the, the, <clears throat> the uh, one distinction that you're making is the degree of integration of the, the different uh, approaches or points of view. Uh, interdisciplinary might be more tightly woven as opposed to the the multidisciplinary, uh, where it might be uh, a little bit more modular, it can be. And again, yeah. I feel that the outcomes that you're looking for in in each type of in in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary are are, are it's nuanced. It's a little, they're a little different. Yeah, but happy to hear from my co panelists about any thoughts about that so I, I i support that i support exactly what you're saying i think you said it much more eloquently than i ever could but i i think back to when i worked at social sciences and humanities research council a lot of the grants that we were giving were interdisciplinary right so it's um having the biology and the psychology having the you know engineering with um the legal and it was that that so when I think of inter interdisciplinary, I'm thinking of it like you said that theoretical, right? It's it's more of a faculty. Like I think of it more from a university perspective, like the faculty of this with the faculty of that, and they're working together to look at data from you know uh, from a technology perspective, but also from a social science perspective, right? And what does that look like? Whereas the multidisciplinary, to me, it's that. It's the, you know, the restaurant, the family, the how do we deliver on an outcome? All of us together, each giving, each bringing our superpower to play. But you said it much more elegantly than I did. No, what you, your examples were perfect. <laughs> so I'm trying to imagine two, two of the chefs working on a single dish might be interdisciplinary but the restaurant as a whole is multidisciplinary. So that the one dish is, okay, never mind. I was, I was trying to fish for, for the analogy that, that uh, if two, two chefs are working on one dish and it comes out with, with some of both of their perspectives, that might be closer to the interdisciplinary, whereas the restaurant as a whole has waiters and, and uh, the, the host and et cetera. I Okay, so if we take that analogy, I would almost think of it like you've got two restaurants, you got the Italian restaurant over here and you've got, you know, the Thai restaurant and they're going to work together to come up with some sort of a fusion something or other. And what could that potentially look like? That to me would be the interdisciplinary, but each each kitchen has a multidisciplinary, you got your, you got your chef, you've got, you know, your prep line, you've got your uh, dishwashers, you've got your waiters. Each restaurant is running its own multidisciplinary in order to deliver um, dishes out. That that would that work, maybe, Courtney? That would work. Chef? 
yeah. Okay, that 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 helps me. I needed the analogy. Thank you. Uh, and I, so one one thought I had was how how much is that going to matter to the to our audience in in putting together a project, and and a lot of the people in the audience might have been part of a cross functional team. Uh, is it is that are they all close enough that you could be talking about them together uh, in a government project, or uh, is it important to be making these distinctions? So I think from um, like I'll, so I'll use Transport Canada as a good example. A lot of the we, work we do, I mean, our goal is to get people and stuff from one end of Canada to the other safely and securely, right? So if you if you take that, it really is about transportation, but we're going across land, so there's an environmental impact. We have uh, ports, so there's uh, an impact on you know the oceans. That you know we work very closely with Environment Canada. We work very closely with uh, with NRC. We work very closely with NRCan. We work very closely with StatCan. Um, and so for us, it's really it, that's where you start looking at the you know the interdisciplinary, where it's not just about trans. We don't we don't have little you know. Um, those things you put on horses where we're blinders, right? Where we're just talking about transportation. We can't be, we're talking about, you know, indigenous groups um, where, you know, how do we get, how do we transport food and how do we, you know, and what impact is it on, on their lands and on, you know, on communities. So I think it's just, it's, it's looking at a much broader spectrum. Um, at least that's, that's how we, how we look at it. So we, we look at the, the whole, it's, um, in, in, in computer science, you learn about sort of systems thinking where you're looking at, you know, if I pull a lever over here, it has an effect over here, right? And being able to look at the entire system as a whole. Um, so I think that's something that, that from an interdisciplinary perspective is something that's super important on for all of us. And I think Courtney, you've done a fantastic job mentioning that throughout, you know, talking about the environmental, social, health and safety, public health, ethical, like there's so many different facets. And I think it really, and the more we talk to people, um, as Abhishek was saying, and as Kate was saying, you know, the more we speak with people, the more we have those conversations, there are things you don't know you don't know. There are parts, like I would never have thought to bring in, you know, auditors to sit in on my projects until someone, I met an auditor and he's like, hey, you know, we could actually, provide some value and I thought oh, ever since then I always do that right so it's it's about having those conversations and 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 really widening your view um, to what it is that you're you're delivering all right thank you oh yes Abhishek well, I was just going to add I uh, I think Teresa made an excellent point well once she touched on computer science which that's my background so I was yay uh, but uh, that point on on systems thinking, I think, is is essential. And for those who are looking for a great resource for that, uh, Donella Meadows' book on systems thinking is sort of the canonical place to start, and and absolutely fantastic. I think the two things that I'll, I'll point out when when we're thinking about a multidisciplinary approach is is to look at both the components and the interactions, right? And and that's something that comes from that world of systems thinking as well, is to think about the entities, the components but also the interactions between them. And then, you know, when we're talking about these, you know, effects of, you know, pulling a lever here and something else changes, do you have, you know, these first, second, third, and order effects? Um, it also helps because sometimes it becomes overwhelming when you dive into the world of systems thinking, you, you, you experience uh, a, a degree of paralysis almost that, oh, this is too much, how do I handle it? And there it helps to define, again, from the world of systems thinking, a system boundary so that it, it is well scoped and so that you don't experience this paralysis. Um, and, and, and it might sound like, oh, well, you know, so what? Uh, but it, it, it ends up being a very practical way to move forward when you're working with a variety of people together and trying to apply these ideas in practice, having a concrete definition of what the system boundary is and then thinking about the entities and interactions helps you move forward in a, in a meaningful fashion rather than being sort of bogged out uh, by it. So I'm trying to interpret and 
the the primary components then are, have been mostly people in everything we've said today and the primary interaction is some type of communication there there seem to have been some secondary discussions about tools but the primary uh, interact or the primary interaction is communication and is that accurate from everybody's point okay i see all all members of the panel mostly shaking uh, right nodding their heads yes uh yes abhishek sorry i i i i'm probably taking up too much time but I, I also wanted to add, like, if we're, if we're, you know, being slightly future looking, we're, we're, we're talking about components today being the entities today being people. It's not, and, you know, some people will push back on this, but it is not that far-fetched to imagine that we will have smarter machine components as well as a part of team structures. And, and not in the way a human is, but as potential partners in co-developing solutions. And I'm, I'm just thinking for those who are familiar, the recent developments in image generation by providing a text prompt. So you have uh, new tools like Dolly 2, which I mean, I say new to newer tools now are mid journey and stable diffusion, which you give it a text prompt and it provides amazing, amazing outputs that are at least to my untrained eye, uh, indistinguishable from what uh, you know, creative artists might put out, and and of course that's to the untrained eye, right? Uh, but you'll you you'll start to then have to model. The reason I bring up this example is in envisioning our multidisciplinary approach, we will also now start to have to think about the interactions that you have with the you know smarter machine components that you know start to be a part of your team. So it's not. And and the reason I'm making that distinction is that they're not quite tools, but they 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 become just a step above in in being a little more active and having a little bit more agency than a tool, which is completely passive uh, in in how it interacts. So I'll just make one quick comment about these these tools that that look intelligent. Most of the comments now in using this stable diffusion and all these art tools is that you have to be an expert in creating the query that creates a reasonable picture. So the, the human intelligence is not disappearing, it's just moving. Anyway, I, I wanted to come back to this, this system thinking and with the idea of, of people and uh, their communication as the connection. One question that, that we've had on uh, is about how do you make decisions? If you've got a, a whole graph of these people all connected, uh, how do you, Reach, do you reach consensus, or is there some sort of governance structure that that uh, creates these uh, the decisions about how to move forward? Yes, Kate. Sorry, I was struggling with my mute button. I think I think there's um I think there's a balance on it. I think it depends what you're doing. I think. Um, at, at least in the world I work in, in, in government, there's inevitably someone who is accountable for the decision that will be made. And that person will eventually have to make that decision. I think it would be uh, a mistake not to be open to the views of others around the table, but there does come a tipping point. You can see this happen in any, I, I imagine many people can, can reflect on times they've been in a group where a decision has not been made and that creates tension within the group. And then people start to get antsy. Like you, you start to feel when that needs to happen. I mean, how you make that decision when you determine whether or not you have enough information to make an appropriate decision, those are judgment calls. I mean, I think sometimes it's a recognition that perfect is the enemy of the good. You will do something that is your absolute best advice with the information you have available to you at the time an openness to iterate, an openness to improve, an openness to feedback in various ways that you're going to receive it, um, and an open acknowledgement of what any risks might be if you are under pressure and it is, it's it's time to cut bait. I mean, these are the perspectives we've not considered. This is the risk we think may happen. This is how we plan to address it. I think it's just being, honestly, I think it's just being honest about where you're at. And I think one one part of something you had said earlier could be added on there is that people need to feel that their contribution is valued and important so that 
the the final decision it shouldn't it be just made by that person who's accountable there should have been some process that took all of the input into account uh, and recognized that that input in making the decision uh, which i heard you say earlier uh yes uh Teresa. Yeah, just to add on to what Kate was saying, I think you can also, we, I, I, I've always prescribed to, you know, pushing that accountability and that decision making down to the lowest common denominator as, as low as you possibly can on the totem so pole. So you don't end up, you know, having this one person who's accountable for everything who has actually no, no understanding of how all the different pieces work. And I mean, that's, it's, it's a fundamental tenet of product management. Um, but I think it's very important from a governance perspective to be able to push it down and then to look at, you know, as Kate was saying, look at the risks, right? So if it's a decision that is reversible and it's a low risk, um, then yeah, for sure. Maybe you're, you know, the, the person who's, who's uh, the individual contributor can 100% make that decision, right? But that needs to be clarified at the very beginning, who's making which decisions, what that hierarchy is. Um, and what the risks are that you're you're willing to take from that decision making. Yes, hey, Courtney. I I just to add on to what Kate and and Teresa have um, said is just I think an important part, and both of them touch on this is maybe at the beginning having a clear process, and you know having everyone understand how their inputs will be used um, and in, in that process. And again, kind of setting those, those dare I say rules, but like setting the governance structure and um, framework within which you're going to engage. Yes, Abhishek. And, and just to, I think, I think layer on uh, a degree of nuance to, you know, I think what, what everybody said so far is that, you know, you articulate, communicate, and agree on this governance structure that, that you're going to use, how people's inputs are going to be processed, how you're going to listen to them. I think it, it also behooves us to stress test this governance structure and to make sure that it's actually achieving its stated goals. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, the best laid plans, you know, when they meet reality, they just crumble and fall apart. And that can happen with governance structures too, even though that sounds, that is an abstract thing. Uh, but are we actually able to enable the people who we want to be a part of this process to have their voices be heard, to have their inputs be incorporated? And I'm, I'm not saying that I have all the answers in terms of how you would go about stress testing it, but there is this notion in you know the world of cybersecurity called red teaming. Try to red team the governance structure and see how you can make it fail. Like hire someone whose job is to break things, systems ethically, I might add, uh, and see if there are well, well, that's it's important, folks. Uh, but uh, you know, ask them if there are ways that they can find to subvert the governance structures that you've put in place to get you know to suppress voices, to just get their ideas out front. And it, it might reveal to you shortcomings in that governance structure that could be helpful. I think this is very, very useful. The last few few answers have actually answered one of the questions that I didn't explicitly read out, but I'll, I'll read it now and you can see if you want to add anything to it. What are your thoughts about management proofing or governance proofing multidisciplinary outcomes? We often be bring in all the people and come up with great plans, but then management changes or governance impacts it and we just go back to the status quo. If that sort of situation happens from what uh, Abhishek was saying, you might lose the confidence of all of the people you want to be contributing to the overall answer and then not be able to achieve multidisciplinary approaches in the future. Uh, Kate, the, looks like you're thinking about something there. Yeah, I don't, I don't hide it well. I've always wanted a poker face, and it's never happened. <laughs> so, um, it's it's interesting, right? Because anytime anytime you change the humans that you are working with, 
they will have different views, different perspectives. They will have a different context from which they have come. They may or may not be comfortable sharing said context. They may think what you're doing and the way you're doing it is uh, like, and like, how is this how this is operating? And you may know through your experience that it's actually operating quite well. But then I, I mean, I hate to return to the same tenants, but it is about like communicating clearly, like these are the benefits, these are why, bringing them along, having them understand. Um, and hopefully both both sides of that table being willing to hear one another out about where they're at and why this matters. And maybe they have good ideas on how to adjust it further. I don't know. Um, I'd be curious about what other folks have to say about that too. So it sounds like one of the concerns is that if everything is up for question throughout the whole project, you might not make progress uh, as you as you change people, certainly. So uh, the only the only thing I'll add is um, I think you know. I, I'm I'm all about doing like it's nice to plan. I like planning. Like you have to plan, but I feel like in government there's a lot of planning, a lot of time spent planning, and not always a lot that much time spent on the execution. If you can plan and execute, and if you can chunk it into smaller bite size, so that you plan, execute, you have a big picture in mind, but it's a bit fuzzy. Like you, I don't know what's going to happen in a year from now. I kind of, I kind of, I know what my outcome is and really focusing on the outcome, but not so much the, the how it's going to happen in a year or how it's going to happen in two years, but what can I accomplish within the next few weeks or the next few months and really focusing on that and then delivering on that. And then that becomes your input into, you know, your output becomes the input into the next step in the process. And I think if you can focus on just more discrete things, when you, and your management will a hundred percent change. It will. People will come in, people will go out, new person comes in, suddenly, you know, they really want to level up to the next EX level. So they're going to, you know, come in and say, oh, this is ridiculous. We're going to go in this direction now because, you know, I want to look like a superhero. So that the, the ego, the people, the human, like you can't get away from that. You always have that. But at least if you have discrete pieces that you, that, you know, tell a larger story, but if you've already delivered on five of the, you know, 12 pieces, you can still pivot, but you already have those locked in and very rarely are you going to go back and start from, but if you only have a plan and you've been planning to plan and you've got all these plans, those are very easy to wipe away and start new. So I kind of like, I, I like, I like having, I have a bit of a bit a blitzkrieg approach to, uh, to um, management where it's just do it, get it done, put it out there. Put it out before anyone else does and then you've got a success people there you know people get excited they feel like oh you know i've accomplished something and it helps the team gel it helps you figure out you know where there may be gaps as well and the the, the faster you can push things out and they're concrete and they're real and they don't have to be perfect right kate like you know like you were saying like it doesn't have to be perfect but it's something and then people can react to that and actually say that was terrible okay well let's try it again then um, or let's try it a little bit differently, but at least uh, being able to react to things and putting things out the door is really, for me, the, 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 the best way, the best approach. Um, cause it, it just, it ticks off a lot of boxes. We get our dopamine hit and it just helps the team and, and it gives you a bit of resilience, right? So when people do question and say, oh, you know, new management comes in, why are we doing this? Well, here's why we've actually put this out and we have some people using it and it's actually really successful. Yeah, I was sick. I I absolutely love everything Teresa just said because that's that's kind of how we do it in the world of software engineering as well, right? Where you have agile and again, you know, apologies because there's like a million flavors of agile and everybody has their own opinion on it, but very loosely speaking, agile. Um, it's it's this idea of discrete chunks is is doing it in sprints, right? So addressing, I think, what what Kate and Joel you both of you pointed out is you, you can't have all of the structure evolving all of the time, right? So you freeze it and then you iterate on it, experiment on it and gather metrics or gather some sort of an evaluation of whether it worked or not. Because experimentation also, you know, it's, it's a scientific approach, right? You start with a hypothesis, experiment, document the results and see, you know, whether it worked or not. 
and then iterate based on that. And I think, again, you know, borrowing from the world of software engineering, if if you apply some sort of version control and 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 documentation to what's been tried, you also have this accumulated base of evidence that you know when someone else as as people change as they inevitably will you can point back and say hey we have tried this and here's the evidence for why it worked or it didn't work so that nobody likes you know it, it's it, it's it's great to have opinions it's even better to have you know evidence that you know can support your opinion so so taking that i think helps to 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 do this in a systematic fashion right uh, but again, it's it's also to to Kate's point is uh, uh, in software engineering we say this too you know perfect product never ships, and and we'll never get to a perfect product in terms of what that approach needs to be. So constant iteration and experimentation, but doing so in a scientific fashion, I think systematic scientific fashion is 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 important. Okay, very good. So I, maybe what we can do, if there's any any last words, each of the panelists would would like to uh, share. Maybe then we could go go around the table and uh, any summary statement you'd like to make. I yeah, I can I can kick it off. Um, so I look at the end of the day, we you know. We have to deliver services, whether it's internally, you know, if you're if you have HR, or if it's externally, you're, you know, delivering, um, um, I don't know, uh, tax information to to citizens. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we all have we have to serve, and we have we have inputs, we have outputs. Um, I think bringing the more people you can bring to the table, the the better service you are delivering. Right, whether you're delivering it to citizens, to businesses, um, or internally to your to your colleagues within your department or to other departments. Um, one of my favorite uh, multidisciplinary examples, and look, I'll be honest, I have no idea how Airbnb works behind the scenes. I don't know anybody who works there, but my experience um, when COVID hit, we had uh, rented um, a chalet in Tremblant, and there was already it was that. It was that leading up to, oh, you guys are going to be off for two weeks. Remember that? Um, or not off, but you'll be working from home for, it'll just take two weeks, three weeks at the very most. Um, so it was over March break and we had booked uh, a chalet and um, things were starting to get like a little weird. And, you know, we were stockpiling toilet paper and, and the world was kind of in, in chaos and we were all watching news 24 seven. And I think it was the Saturday I was like, uh, I don't know if we should be going to Trombon. Like, I'm a little concerned. So I go on the Airbnb and I'm reading their policies and there's no refunds, there's no nothing. I think you need to have two weeks in advance. Um, otherwise your, your money's locked in, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking, oh shoot, like, I think we're gonna be stuck with this. The next, the Sunday morning when all of the Trombon area in Quebec and, and Ottawa sort of went into a crisis mode, an emergency mode, the next morning, I got an instant email, like saying your money has been refunded and we've canceled your thing based on, you know, what's going on in the world. And I thought, that's incredible. Think of what had to happen at Airbnb behind the scenes. You had the policy people who, write, who had to rewrite the policy, right, to specifically, and not just for my region, for all of Canada, for all of the world, right? They had to look at every region and see what did their what did their political parties uh, put forward. What were their directives? And they had to pivot and adjust. They had to be able to work with the banks to to reinstate the money. So, like, think of all those. And then someone had to code it. Someone had to design it. Someone had to code it. Someone the comms people had to be involved. Of how are we going to communicate this to people? All that happened like that, from when it was called to when I got my refund was less than twelve hours. Right. So think about that. That that is the power of a multidisciplinary team, because you also have the legal team in there. You know that saying, OK, what are what are we on the hook for? Who can sue us? Right. So that's that's sort of my wrap. And if you do it well, it's seamless to the end user. They don't even notice it's invisible services in the back end. And they go, oh, 
great, my money is returned, excellent. And they move on with their day. And that's really at the end of the day, what you want. That's so I'll pass it over to Courtney. I love that example, um, Teresa. It, it's a great one and very, um, very tangible, I think for a lot of us. <laughs> Uh, so just maybe going back to the very first question that was asked about, you know, multidisciplinary approaches and what it means to us, um, I guess, I mean, I've learned so much from the different perspectives on this panel, so I'm very grateful for that, but, you know, really just um, all of the opportunities that will come from collaborating with, with peers from different disciplines, I think, at least in our discussions have demonstrated to me that you know, um, I, I, it, it's really, you need those perspectives. Um, and I think that it'll, it'll really, it'll really help you solve, um, you know, those complex issues that, that, you know, we're all facing today. And, and I highly recommend it for our colleagues on the line who haven't tried it and are thinking on embarking uh, in their own teams, uh, you know, the different multi multidisciplinary approaches uh, to solve solve their issues. So um, I highly recommend it. That's what I will leave you with. We, we are running a little bit uh, near near to the hour. Uh, so maybe what I'll do now is, is just say thank you to everyone, uh, especially to our panelists. This has been excellent. Uh, I don't need to share some key points. I, I think we heard uh, Quite a quite a, a wide ranging set of uh, important uh, uh, principles and practices uh, and tools that you can apply in your own uh, circumstances. I really love the, the the set of questions we got. So thanks very much to everybody who sent in questions. Thank you very much again to the panel for for an excellent discussion, uh, wide ranging. And thank you very much for uh, your participation in the audience. Have a great day.